from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our author this afternoon is James McGrath Morris, and I, for one, am very excited to hear from him. As, as you may know, the news business is undergoing some soul-searching and some financial distress, and so it's gratifying to um, talk to someone who has had so much success writing about journalism and about the news business and the, the very interesting characters that have built it. Uh, his books include uh, The Rose Man of Sing Sing, A True Tale of Life, Murder, and Redemption in the Age of Yellow Journalism, as well as Jailhouse Journalism, The Fourth Estate Behind Bars. Uh, the book you'll be discussing today is his most recent work, Pulitzer, A Life in Politics, Print, and Power. It is my great pleasure to give you James McGrath Morris. Thank you. Thank you very much. About six months ago, I was doing what authors usually do, which is travel to small towns because they're people who buy and read books. And I was in a bookstore where a really kind reader felt my pain and asked me a softball question. So he said to me, you've spent five years studying this guy's life. Is there any kind of practical thing that you learned from it? I thought, kind of mumbled some sort of incoherent answer. Well, six months later, I have the answer. So if he's out there, here's the answer. And if you want to take notes, feel free. The answer is, if you make a lot of money in life and you endow a prize like Pulitzer did, everybody will know the prize, but they will not remember who the heck you were. And for me as an author, this actually gave me an opportunity because there are a lot of giants in the 19th century. Morgan, uh, Rockefeller, and we think they have no connection to our lives, but they do. Most of you drove an oil-powered automobile to come here. We're talking about Rockefeller. Many of you are hopefully going to run over and buy a book, and you're going to whip out a credit card, which is based on a financial system invented by Morgan. Well, Pulitzer is one of those geniuses from the 19th century who is the midwife of the modern mass media who, in a sense, may have brought you here. You learned about the event, maybe electronically on the Washington Post website, but this whole notion of disseminating news and all of those things are owed to us or came to us from Pulitzer. And so for me as an author, it was a great opportunity because here I'm writing about one of the giants of the 19th century who most people knew nothing about. So unlike reading about Morgan or Rockefeller, every time you turn the page, it's an opportunity for me to tell you something new. So I want to leave you with a couple of aspects of why Pulitzer is so important to us, how in a sense his hand is still reaching out through the grave and touching our lives today and affecting the way we communicate, the way we organize news. And I'm not going to tell you a whole story about Pulitzer, who started off life as a Hungarian immigrant, came here as a mercenary soldier. I want to tell you about how he reshaped journalism, which in a sense was a boring craft before the man arrived and changed things. And the first seminal moment is in 1878, when he invests his last few dollars in buying a bankrupt evening paper in the city of St. Louis on the steps of the St. Louis courthouse, the same courthouse that decided the Dred Scott decision. And all his friends think he's nuts. An afternoon paper in a city where three afternoon papers are being published, none of which are making money, and he's buying a bankrupt paper. And this is one of the distinguishing moments in his life that will reflect the characteristics that caused him to reshape our society. Because he's not an inventor. He's not like Bell or somebody who said, gee, we need a gadget where we can talk to each other. What he was is a man who could perceive huge social tra tra trends, sort of like de Tocqueville did before. And the analogy I give, and people think I've really lost my marbles when I suddenly ask you to imagine a surfer, and here I'm talking about a 19th century figure, but I want you to see this before I talk about Pulitzer. If you've ever been to the coast where there's surfers and you look out, out on the waves, far past the waves where they're breaking, there'll be young men and women on their boards, and they're probably old surfers too, let's just say men and women on their boards, and they're paddling very slowly. And suddenly they paddle furiously, 
and they ride a huge wave that forms, somehow those good surfers are able to detect the slight undulations in the water and realize that's the big wave. Pulitzer did that with our society. Here he was in St. Louis, and he realized that farmers were leaving their farms in Illinois and Missouri and coming to the city because of industrialization. They were becoming factory workers. So what were they doing? They were commuting. Women who used to be important economic decision makers on the farms were now becoming housewives. This is all going to play into something you're going to see in a second. Gaslight and electric light allowed people to entertain themselves in the evening by reading. A new printing press had been invented by Ho that could print papers quickly. Paper was being made from trees that had the tensile strength to go through these machines at high speed. And the Victorian internet had arrived, you call it the telegraph, bringing news from New York and Washington to St. Louis as fresh as that morning. So he took all of these ingredients and published an afternoon paper with news from Washington and New York as fresh as that morning, sold it to commuters heading home desperate for entertainment, filled with entertaining tales about the city and economic decision-making material for the housewives, advertisements. Where can you buy gingham? Where can you buy flour? And as a result, he created this new medium of mass communication in St. Louis that, rep that became a huge success. So now let's move along and see why it went from St. Louis to elsewhere. New York in the, 1900, in the 19th century was really the capital of the United States. Now I know you're thinking, here I've come to Washington and I'm saying I'm ignorant. No, no, no. This was a swamp-infested place that only politicians went. Broadway and the music and the theater, that was New York. Publishing, that was New York. Media, the newspapers, that was New York. And so Pulitzer was waiting and biding his time to get to New York, and he did the same. He came to New York in 1883, bought a bankrupt newspaper, brought his Western style of journalism to New York, and became an instant success there with a newspaper none of us know anymore because it's gone, the New York world. And it was such a success instantly because he replicated what he learned in St. Louis, but he added something very important. As an immigrant, he looked to the Lower East Side of New York and saw these vast teeming waves of new Americans. And he didn't see them as a threat. He saw them as a strength, as something he could, like himself, they were going to contribute to the United States. So he admonished his reporters to go and write about their lives. So his reporters descended on the Lower East Side and wrote stories about their lives, but not just about their lives, they were using Dickens as their model, tell stories about their lives. So the world would come out with a headline, Tiny Tot Falls to Its Death as Mother Looks On. And on the upper reaches of Fifth Avenue, where people drink their tea with their little finger up, one of them would say, oh, Elizabeth, look at this sensationalistic prattle that's going on in the paper. And they were missing the point. Because if you went to the Lower East Side and you went in the black and tan bars or the overcrowded dining rooms of those tenement houses, what were those families talking about? They were indeed talking about the children that had fallen off the roof the night before because the tenements were so hot, something we know today in this tent, um, so hot that in order to sleep, people went to the top floor and children sometimes at night rolled off the roofs to their deaths. So he wasn't covering sensationalism, he was writing about their lives. And as a result, he gave them a newfound dignity. Now, if any of you were to invite me home, and don't worry, this is just an analogy, you don't have to do this, I'm betting that on your refrigerators you have a clipping, a clipping of a wedding, your son and daughter's school achievements, sports things. Those events occurred irregardless of the clipping. The clipping, the putting it into print, gives that moment a dignity, a meaningful representation that you cherish and keep. Well, imagine in the world before television and radio, those stories encapsulated their lives and gave dignity to those people. 
and for once somebody was paying attention to them. So they, in return, would pen, spend their pennies buying the paper, of course making the New York world this enormous success, reaching a circulation of a million copies when there were only 64 million people in the United States. So as this goes on, there's something else that relates to their lives. The French have decided to give us a gift, the Statue of Liberty. And if you remember your history, the Statue of Liberty is a gift of the French people to the American people, not of the French government. The French people had raised the money privately, and in turn, we were supposed to raise the money, but we were failing. So Pulitzer put it on the front page of his newspaper that the money to build the pedestal for the statue was not coming in. He editorialized and said, we need to bring this money in. And people every day, poor people, kids, came to the paper and gave a penny or a nickel. Now, it may not seem like much, but understand, Pulitzer is like a robber baron of that time. He's a corporate chieftain. And the poorest people in New York were coming in and entrusting them with their pennies and nickels for the Statue of Liberty. And in return, he was putting their name in the newspaper. So a, ch a kid, what they called street Arabs or street urchins, by giving the world a, pay a penny, would have his name in the same newspaper that covered the Astors, the Vanderbilts, and all the great names of the society. So the pedestal was built with that money, the statue arrived, and it was erected with the money of these people. So Pulitzer was changing the New York landscape by his new use of media and exemplifying a kind of intimate trust that no institution might have today. I don't think many of you are going to rush to some large corporation and give them some change and say, I trust you to keep it for some project. We have foundations and 501c3s. So there's another change that's going to go on that's going to symbolize how he's changed our lives and created, or it was the midwife of the modern mass media. His paper has become such a success it needs a new headquarters, and Pulitzer's life is becoming a dramatic change because he's falling blind. So like Beethoven, who can't hear his own music, Pulitzer can't read his own work, but he's creating this this huge media enterprise, and he needs a new headquarters. So he chooses a spot in New York, and this is the second practical lesson for you. He buys a hotel called French's Hotel. French's Hotel was a hotel on Park Row that had thrown him out of the lobby when he was an unemployed veteran. And if you remember the old adage, revenge is a dish best served cold, 20 years later he comes by, back, buys a hotel, and tears it down for his headquarters. Now, Park Row is significant in another way in that time period. This is the world before Twitter, before CNN, before any of these kind of instant communications. So if you wanted to know who won the election, you would go down to Park Row, and on the buildings, they would have blackboards, and they would write, Cleveland is ahead. Well, it wasn't just elections. Everybody went to Park Row. When America's Cup was waged, they telegraphed the results, and they had small ships that moved across. There was a boxing match on one of the islands, and they had marionettes reenacting the fight as the telegraphs came in. Now, for those of you who are old enough, you're going to get this. Think about it. The crowd loved it so much, they asked the marionette crew to do it all over again. That is instant replay a century before ABC's Wide World of Sports. So Park Row is a terrifically important aspect of life in New York. It's the Fleet Street. It's where the Tribune was, a little unknown newspaper called the New York Times, the Herald, and the New York world was being built there. So he built the tallest building on the globe. And on the top of it was a dome that was gold-leafed. And in that office was where the editorial crew that wrote the world and produced a paper that on Sundays was as thick as a telephone book with things like dress patterns, the greatest invention of that time, of course, the Color Sunday comic or cartoon, um, mu sheet music that you could use to play long before we had iPods and could download music. You could buy the New York World and get sheet music and play a so the newest song that night in your home. Recipes, serialization of novels, uh, economic uh, instruction. So this immigrant population turned to the world for all of this kind of instruction on Sundays and got it for just a few pennies. So this building went up, and it was the tallest building in the world at that point, on the globe. 
and it was at the centerpiece of New York. So just like he was re redoing the American mass media and reshaping it, he was reshaping the New York skyline in a way that's so symbolic that I want to finish telling you this tale. Imagine these immigrants now coming to the United States in the late 19th century, 1890 or so. And folks, this isn't a casual trip. They're leaving the Ukraine, Poland, and places like that. When they say goodbye to their parents, there's no cheap Delta flight home next year to come home for the holidays. They probably never see their family alive. They're gambling their last pennies to come to this new land and try to get a foothold in this economic dream. So they're arriving in the New York Harbor in steerage in these overcrowded ships. And they come up to the deck. And the first thing they're going to see is the Statue of Liberty on a pedestal erected by the pennies and nickels of the people who came before them. Now, they may be ignorant of the pedestal, but they knew what the Statue of Liberty is. At that moment, they turn, and they look at the New York skyline for the first time in their lives. And it's their first view of the world in which they're basing their future hopes on. And if the conditions are just right, the sun is gleaming off the gold dome. And so the tallest building, taller than Trinity Church, the, the thing that's lighting up in the distance is not a monument to commerce, not a monument to banking or retail or agriculture. It's a monument to the American mass media, the only constitutionally protected business in our society. And specifically, it's their first glimpse of the world newspaper that will be their key to economic growth, their key to learning Americaniz uh, Americanisms of all sorts, their key to learning the English language. He admonished, Pulitzer admonished his reporters to write short, punchy sentences to tell everything in the form of a story because he knew who his readers were. And of course, his interest was political power, so he hoped they would eventually turn to the editorial page and learn his suggestions as who to vote for. And that certainly worked. The first Democratic president elected after the Civil War was Grover Cleveland. And you can do the math. It's the paper that got him elected. So what Pulitzer left us with after changing the New York landscape physically and changing the American mass media is a legacy we still have today. The notion of news at its core being a story. He would tell his reporters that every day I want people in there at dinner to say, did you read that in the world today? Producers at NBC or anything are often saying, I want my audience to say, did you see that story today? And the key to that is the story and the humanization of the story. Think of all the great tragedies that have occurred in our modern lives. The Haiti earthquake, famine in Africa. When you read that millions of people are hurt by something, it becomes a number. But we're moved to act when we read the story of the one child who's rescued under the rubble after three days. And that's the magic that he was leaving us with, that in our lives exists essentially a story. And the magic of the news media is to capture that story, to humanize it, and to give it to us. And that's why the world grew to be the most powerful newspaper in America, where governors in the state of Oregon would write all the way to New York and say, would you endorse me? And I bet you today that no governor of Oregon is writing to the New York Times and saying, would you endorse me? And so what I enjoyed about my five-year journey is it was like being an archaeologist. I was uncovering a world we're forgotten. The world paper is gone. We now have other papers that have replaced it. Pulitzer is remembered as a trivial pursuit, like a name of a prize, but no one can tell you what he did. And that was the joy I had in the last five years writing, and that's the joy I've had in answering questions from readers. Now, I have some time. I timed it just right, right? 10 minutes to um, answer questions. And there are mics on each side. Um, and I'll try not to take six months to come up with the appropriate answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what was uh, Pulitzer's connection to drama, theater, and the other prizes that have his name? What was the connection of Pulitzer, drama, theater, and other things? Personal. Pulitzer, um, there are a lot of reasons why the Pulitzer Prize was created. Um, one of which is that, as you probably know, in 1898, he engages in the circulation war with Randolph Hearst. 
yellow journalism, a pejorative term comes about, and he feels stained by that. All of his major achievements are forever linked to this awful period, much like certain presidents who might have been in office for eight years are always remembered for one little moment, and every we forget the rest. So Pulitzer created the Pulitzer Prize in part to cleanse his reputation. And secondly, which I'll get to in a second, about uh, his belief in journalism that changed. But the reason there were prizes for drama and um, history and music is a personal reflection of his love of those things. When he falls blind, he has readers who travel with him, who read him novels, he loved Dickens, who he had a personal pianist who would play music, he loved opera, and he thought these were important parts of a civilized society to have and a reward. But um, back to the major prize, Pulitzer got into journalism because he wanted political power, and journalism was the other side of that coin back. Politics and journalism were just two sides of the same coin in the 19th century. But as he became a publisher and, and worked in journalism, he came to understand that it was a far more important craft than personal political power. And the most important prize, as far as he was concerned, and it may sound quaint today, is the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. The notion that journalism may be a business, yes, you've got to pay your employees, but at the heart of it, is it's, a, it's an important part of American Democrat, Demo democratic process, and that's part of the reason for the prize. Uh, should I, sh I guess I should take turns and go to this side. Yes? Um, you kind of responded to my question just then, but maybe you could expand on it. There's a lot of bemoaning now about the corporate media and um, with the implication being that the pre-corporate media was somehow very altruistic and just concerned about public service. But it's always been a business, hasn't it? And can you talk about the difference between the corporate media today and the corporate media of the 19th century? Um, certainly, they both had, this is a question about the corporate media in the 19th century versus today. They both had the same concern. They have to make money in order to work. Most of the corporate media, I think, in my commentary, that engages in a greater public service of the family-owned newspapers because those publishers can make the decision not the, that, uh, that the stockholders aren't going to like, I'm going to subsidize the paper while it's losing money. I mean, Bulitzer did that at times when the paper was losing money. He would simply subsidize the enterprise. Um, but the problem, the corporate media, family-owned or not owned, and something we all face is that news is a terrifically expensive enterprise. To take an educated soul, send them to Afghanistan, and give us important information about the war is not a cheap process. And now that the news media is finding a struggle to monetize to get that income is not a problem for the Washington Post. Yes, it is, they're not making money. It's a problem for us because our society without that kind of unfettered reporting will suffer and will become, will have less and less contrary views as to what's going on. So the problems are similar, but the diversity in the 19th century was so much larger than it is today. Sir. Uh, excuse me, you mentioned in passing William Randolph Hearst. Yes. And uh, it seems to me to the extent to which Pulitzer is remembered uh, historically, he tends to be paired with Correct. Hearst. Yeah. Um, could you uh, perhaps spend a couple of minutes doing a little compare and contrast sure. between the two men? question is about um, the yin and yang. William Randolph Hearst was, and I, I, I'm not belittling Hearst, but he was ultimately the best imitator of Pulitzer. He studied Pulitzer's methods. He came to New York. He bought a newspaper that was um, interestingly started by Pulitzer's younger brother. So every day when Pulitzer opened up the journal and realized this competitor might put him out of business, he was competing with the work of his brother. Talk about sibling rivalry. Um, Hearst, in many ways, outdid Pulitzer on some of the less, uh, less good aspects of their journalism, engaged in greater sensationalism than the world did, um, and, and, is, and was far more successful at that. But the key moment comes with the Spanish-American War, and I'm sure many of you heard Mr. Thomas talking about his book today. Um, during the Spanish-American War, these two papers competed in a way that we've never had that kind of competition. And they began to make up stories. Now, Pulitzer was blind and in depression over the loss of his daughter and in Jekyll Island. So in New York, William Randolph Hearst was leading his troops to compete against the world, and Pulitzer was a, had troops that had no general. And they knew if the paper collapsed, they couldn't go to work for Hearst. So every outlandish thing Hearst did, they tried to do equally so. 
give you an example. Her paper had a story about a colonel that was killed in the war with a really odd last name, like Philip Nulupsip or something like that. The world picked up the story, reprinted it entirely. The next day, the journal announced that if you look at the guy's last name, it's an anagram for We Pilfer the News. Now, when the Spanish-American War was over and this competition was over, a Pulitzer came back to his senses, and he, had, and he put out an edict that they couldn't engage in this kind of reprehensible, sensationalistic journalism, but the damage had been done. So I like to give the comparison to Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty, and I hope you all read the last story, because if not, I'm giving something away. They fight in Switzerland, and they both fall to their death. History will always link. Open up any high school history textbook. It's always Hearst and Pulitzer, yellow journalists linked in this. And Pulitzer was never able to escape that. So all the achievements I'm telling you about are lost because Pulitzer will always be linked as a yellow, sensationalistic uh, journalist. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Good. A few years ago, when I was in the fifth grade, I wrote a paper on Pulitzer in the St. Louis Post. I wish I'd found it during my research. Well, I had talked to you at Politics and Prose. We both used the same little pamphlet on the history of the oh, Post-Dispatch. I, I do. Uh, your book was better and certainly more recent. But could, <laughs> could, you. could you dwell a little bit more on the relationship with his brother? Was his brother at all successful? And did they dislike each other or just ignore each other? The question is about Pulitzer's unknown brother, Albert. Pulitzer came from a large family in which all the children died by the time he was 13, except for his younger brother, Albert, who came to the United States after Joseph Pulitzer. And just like his older brother, he got into journalism. And this really infuriated Joseph, who was quite an egomaniac, that his younger brother not only got into journalism, but was doing better than he was, started a newspaper in New York which was nothing but gossip. It was called the Chambermaid's Delight. I mean, that was his nickname. But it sold copies, and here was his brother, a millionaire publishing in New York, and he was stuck in St. Louis with a respectable paper. So it really bugged him. When he came to New York, he tried to force his brother to merge papers, which was his habit. His brother said, why should I merge with you? Pulitzer stole his entire staff. Didn't matter, it continued. Albert later sold the paper, and it became the paper that William Randolph Hearst God. What was great for me was my little moment of, um, of discovery was I found Albert's memoirs with his granddaughter stored in Paris. So this book is the first to be able to offer Albert's side of the story. And trust me, it's not exactly <laughs> flattering to his older brother. And any of you who have siblings would just love this kind of aspect. We've got time for one more question, and I'll answer it briefly. I am watching the clock. Hi. I'm sorry. I missed... Can you come closer to the mic so I can hear? I'm sorry. I missed most of your presentation, but I was just curious um, with newspapers versus like um, media that, you know, is on television. Um, I don't really understand why anybody endorses a candidate. I guess I look at the why newspaper. Why they endorse a candidate, you're saying? Right, because I look at it as an objective field, but oh, I guess I'm missing the something. The question is why endorse a candidate in an objective field? This may be an issue of my age. See, when I grew up, I learned how to be media savvy. The front page of the newspaper was news. The owner who owned the editorial page expressed his or her opinion as to who would be elected. And these two things don't always agree. Any of you who've read the Wall Street Journal wonder if the people in the editorial page are reading the front page, because the front page may talk about you know, how some financial bill is going to ruin America, and you turn to the editorial page and say, we've got to pass this bill. That was much more common today. I think what's happening with broadcast is those distinctions are becoming more blurred. Certain networks, particularly one that might start with a letter F, tends to engage in, in what we might, as older people, feel like editorialization in the reporting. And that's a change. That's not the way the media originally was. There was a cardinal line that divided the editorial division from the news division. And the news division often reported stuff that the owners and the editorial page didn't like. But I leave you with this thought. A Liebling said this. And this is why those folks enjoy owning newspapers. Freedom of the press, as he reminded us, belongs to those who own the presses. And so if you ever get upset about an editorial in the Washington Times or the Washington Post, um, there is an op-ed section edited by a wonderful man 
get your voice in there, and that would have been the thing Pulitzer would have liked because he was one of the first piece of people to ever publish an op-ed article, meaning an article by an individual that appeared in the paper that might not agree with his viewpoint. Thank you. You're a delightful group. And thank you on behalf of all the authors for the kind of support you give us as writers. When we're working alone for five years, it's nice to know you're out there. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.